Okay, so welcome to the party. Um, just a reminder, where are, are we on the roadmap? We are still into our SSO deep dive for one more day, well, one and a half more days. Friday, we'll start getting into OpenID, and then Monday, we'll do communities. And then Wednesday, we start fun with OAuth. So let's get right into it. We got, it's show and tell day today. It's all about show and tell. Um, and looks like all three of our presenters are here. So Igor, I'm gonna kick it over to you to start us off. Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, let me see if I can navigate this presenter stuff. Um, hopefully this works. Okay. You guys see my screen? Yep. Okay. Uh, let's, well, let's go to... Uh, the presentation first, the slideshow here. Uh, okay, interesting. Do you see my screen now? Do you see the presentation? Yes. Okay. I see cool. it in full presentation mode. All right, good. So um, today's topic is SSO for multi Salesforce orgs, right? Uh, it's basically how you configure uh, uh, your Salesforce uh, organization. At least you have a multiple of them for various reasons in business. Sometimes there's mergers, sometimes there's different divisions, or very frequently I've seen this happening where you have multiple orgs where it's a global organization and you have just different regions with very different uh, business needs, uh, such as maybe North America versus APAC or versus Japan versus EU or UK or maybe EMEA, right? So you would split that and they might be uh, having totally different orgs, totally different customers completely separate from North America, right? But maybe North American CEO and all the other people want to see what's going on in those other organizations. So that's where the SSO comes in handy. So the way to think of this is uh, hub and spoke, right? That's a concept, conceptually, how you would think of this, where you would have one of the cells, uh, one of the Salesforce organization work as a central IDP, and we would call it a hub. In this case, maybe a US org or North America. And then you have all these other orgs connected as SSO service providers. So they'll be acting as SPs. Uh, and here I have three of them, but you could have many, uh, many different uh, orgs uh, if, you, if you choose to have, right? So some of the things that go into configuring this, right? Uh, so obviously we have to have at least two orgs and I'll do a little bit of demo of that. Uh, so uh, multiple organizations would have, uh, one, one have to be configured as a hub as an IDP and the other one as a service provider. So this is what goes in into SSO setup, right? For identity provider org on a hub. Um, actually, all of the all of these uh, organization would have to have my domain. That will be prerequisite essentially to configure SSO. And then uh, only on the hub we will enable identity provider and make him as a uh, separate uh, org that will control all the credentials and all the uh, login and SAML. And then uh, important piece in that uh, configuration would be the issuer field. When we configure an IDP, and I'll show you kind of where that is, uh, that field will be basically, in, in our case, since I'm using a demo org, it'll be my domain URL, but it could be some other you know, URLs that organization may run as like a, their main um, uh, URL. Uh, so <clears throat> and in this case, that will be the part of the settings. And then uh, we'll need to download the certificate, which will be, in this case, self-signed cert, uh, which will be passing on to the uh, or uploading to our service provider orgs, right? And on the service provider, there's a little bit of a longer uh, stuff that we do. Uh, where we actually setting up a service provider organization uh, as a spoke. We do SSO settings there. Um, I think we've already seen some of that, and this is kind of a, a list of steps where uh, we need to create a, a, a basically name for, for the service provider and then fill in the domain URL from our hub um, and also uh, get the obviously enable domain for that, for that service provider as well. Uh, and then we're choosing a SAML identity type. Um, and login URL, uh, in, in, in our case, would be uh, um, our uh, specific uh, service provider URL that we have. And uh, then we have the uh, selecting an authentication service. 
right? So that will be uh, a selection that we'll do on the um, service provider settings. And then after that, we once we set up the service provider, um, we know who they are, we know what that org is. We would have to create a connected app on our hub uh, or, or main identity provider org for that specific uh, service provider. So essentially, a connected app is what will, what will host a SSO configuration for the identity provider to know that this is a valid uh, spoke that trying to uh, that we're trying to go to as a service provider, right? So this is basically uh, uh, filling up the information on it. I'm just kind of listing steps there um, that will be uh, kind of easy to to understand what we what we get, what we're doing. But we'll show you in the in the org in a minute. Um, and then and then there's uh, there's a couple of challenges, but we'll look at this uh, a little bit later. So let's go into uh, the actual org. So here I have. Um, Let's see, let's make this a little bit bigger. Do you guys see the screen OK? It's oh. pretty tiny. OK, let me see if I can make it bigger. Control plus all there. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's <laughs> does it, does it, does it, is it better? Oh, yes. Can you actually okay. see the text now? <laughs> OK. <laughs> so is it, is it good? Is it this size OK? Well, I'm on a big screen, so You're I don't fine. know. How, yeah. Okay. yeah. I'm on a laptop. It works well. Control okay. plus is the best invention ever. <laughs> yeah. Yes, that's what I use. <laughs> um, so, so this is a. Um, if you look at my URL, this is something I've configured as a. Uh, this is my admin screen. I've configured this uh, org as the hub, um, and I call this uh, United States or North America. Uh, I have this fictitious company called Takumi, and uh, this is the USA headquarters. And that's their main org, right? Uh, or this 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 dev org will play that main org, right? So if we we'll look at his, um, let's see, identity. Look at his identity provider settings. Now we see that I configured a uh, identity provider here, which has an issuer of uh, my basically my URL, which is my domain, right? If we look at my domain, this is what exactly would be there. And then I have my certificate. There's some uh, uh, credentials there. So this is identifying, essentially, that identity provider settings, right? And then um, um, the other part is I have this org, uh, which I have it in Japanese. This is a, a Japanese org uh, that I set it up. Um, essentially, this is an organization that will uh, act as a service provider. So we look at his ID, and uh, single sign-on. So we'll find a single sign-on settings. Uh, just to be kind of a little bit realistic, that's what you would deal with uh, if you were working really with a Japanese counterpart in your in your organization, uh, probably. Uh, so, so this is I've set up a SAML configure. I enable SAML here, uh, as well as my domain, and set up a SAML configuration here. And if we look at this, I called it the Pumi Japan, right? So it is clearly identifiable. So that this is the actual Japan org. And also, if you see my URL here, I also have it defined as a part of the my domain as the Kumi Japan versus the Kumi USA, which was which was this URL here, right? So if users navigating back and forth, and that'd be one of the challenges in this um, in these setups. When you have too many orgs like this, when you're jumping from one to another, and, and it switches context. Sometimes user does not know where they actually are. Um, and that is sometimes a, a complaint that's being brought up. And so one of the ways to deal with it is you brand your applications and you brand your screens and these different orgs so they quickly know, know it, you know, you quickly know that okay, I'm in, in Japanese or I'm in, in EMEA or I'm in USA, right? So that's one way to deal with that kind of um, scenario. And so this is our SSO configuration. Um, I've, I have uploaded a certificate here uh, from, uh, from the um, IDP. And so this is a, a kind of typical settings, what you would do. There's nothing special here. The only thing we do need to note is this URL, uh, which is important. This is login URL for our service provider, because that is what we put in into our IDP, right? Uh, so that these two are connected. Now, another important point is that 
users and user provisioning. So what I've done here, I created um, several users, uh, particularly two, uh, one user that exists in both orgs. And uh, um, in this case, I created a user, uh, let's see, uh, Linda Walker. And if we look at her uh, information, this is her North American ID. Uh, she has a username, Linda Walker, takumi.com. And she has a federation ID in here somewhere. A minute. Let's edit this. Let's see. So there's a there's a federation ID. In my case, it's just a number. It could be employee ID. It could be whatever. And so we would find the same thing on this org as well. So user. And uh, I'm glad you can read Japanese. <laughs> well, I'm showing you this just a kind of a little bit of a challenge there. So you see her federation ID here is one, two, three, four, five, six. Um, I've, I used to work on Japanese orgs before, so I, I kind of can navigate them a little bit. And this is lightning, so uh, it's a little bit challenging too sometimes because searching doesn't really work. Because like if I try to do SSO, no. <laughs> um, because if you look at the identity uh, for SSO, it's actually called shingle sign on sette. Which is in Japanese, right? So, so this is SSO in Japanese, right? Uh, so you can't change your own personal language, even though the whole org is you Japanese. Can. You can. Okay. Yes, I, and I'll show you that quickly. So you're right. just being contrary. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I'm just, I'm just. <laughs> well, I'm just kind of bringing a little bit of fun and challenge here to this to this discussion, right? So that you have two different scenarios. This is an admin view. That's that's kind of what admin would see, and I'll show you what the Linda would see as well as a user, right? Because we're really configuring that for her, for her experience, what she would do. OK. Right. And so I would just want to make a point that we need a federation ID for these users. And these users needs to be created. Now, there's another challenge there is obviously user provisioning with these type of things, where you have users in one org but not the other. Well, typically, in typical scenarios, admins on, on these organizations would provision these users ahead of time and set these single sign-ons up. Uh, but you could also do some of some of stuff with uh, just-in-time provisioning to help propagate this. But mo normally, the challenge comes in not so much of provisioning users, but actually keeping them in sync. For example, things that uh, visibility or profile changes you, that the admin may make on a central org may need to be propagated to the others, right? For example, as would be one one scenario I could think of. Uh, and that is where the just-in-time provisioning will be handy when you would propagate the profile ID changes uh, uh, to, to those kind of things, where if you want to switch uh, maybe profiles between the users. So um, hey, uh, can you, I'm sorry, can you just repeat the last statement? Yeah, so for example, uh, if I want to change the user's profile, right? Uh, for, you know, let's let's say this person moved to a different different. Let's say they became uh, a VP of sales, right? But they were before some other role, uh, and so now they change in that role, and now they're part of. They have more visibility, and now that profile need to be changed. So an admin will go and change it in North America, but then what happens in Japan? What happens in EMEA or other places, right? Uh, and that's where just-in-time provisioning enabled uh, uh, for, for the main org uh, would do would kind of propagate that change for these users because of the because we already have these federation IDs and stuff. So, and David's covering just-in-time provisioning later in the session. So how convenient. Yeah. Okay. So this is kind of part of the settings that I wanted to kind of important points I wanted to touch on. And let's just quickly look at what happens to the. Uh, um, Linda when she's logged in. So here I logged in as, um, uh, oops, yeah, I logged in as Linda Walker. And I am uh, a, a customer support uh, executive that watching over global customer support. And uh, what I've done is this is my homepage. It's very basic, nothing special. I put this little logo here for her on the sales app. So she knows this is a North American logo, little astronomical um, guy there. And so I created this little component here on her homepage that points to this alert international account, let's say, for example, or some other, could be some other queue there. So she knows that she needs to look at this. And this is in a different org. 
So this will actually point to a different organization. So we'll click on this, or she clicks on this. And now she is, you can see she's been redirected seamlessly uh, without logging in, without putting any passwords or anything like that in there. Uh, and this is, by the way, on my uh, incognito browser. So I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not messing with, with this one here. This is separate. Uh, and so she's now here looking at, you could see the URL. And also, you see a different logo. I put in like a little bit of Japanese logo in there uh, that she could tell she's in a different org. And I'm looking at the SoftBank mobile account uh, on that org. And she can go back and forth between the orgs too. So that's really the experience that you're looking for seamless um, kind of integration. Uh, and that's, uh, I think, let's see, I think that's pretty much all I wanted to cover. Yeah, I already could talk about this. So, so did you create a connected app for her as well that she can get oh, to yes. from the app launcher? Yes, yes. Uh, so let me show you that quickly. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, connected app. So it's not in an app launcher, right? So okay. if you look at an app launcher, it's not uh, the connected app was necessary, but it was necessary to identify a service provider. Uh, I create. I modified this standard sales app a little bit to for her to do in a home page. Uh, okay. the, the connected apps are. Uh, let's see. If I could navigate. Better app manager. And now in Lightning, obviously, connected app navigation is a little bit funky. So you can see here, I created a connected app called Takumi Japan that identifies the service provider. And if you look at this app, we can view this, right? Um, this app essentially is what enables the SSO configuration for uh, identity provider to know that this is the, um, the, the Japan org that we're going to be connecting to. You see my ACS URL here, which was a login URL for the Japan org, uh, then my um, issuer. Uh, which is my ID, and then with also setting up a subject here, which will use Federation ID. Now you could use a different. Uh, in this case, I chosen Federation ID to use a number, uh, but you could have used a, a username or user ID, for example, like a Salesforce user ID. All of that be uh, that could be tough, um, uh, and some other custom attributes, for example, maybe maybe your user has a custom field, which in the past I've faced that a few times where a custom field is the only thing that uniquely identifies this user, um, like a golden person ID. And then you would probably use some of that. Um, and so that's the uh, uh, pretty much the configuration you need to do for uh, SSO for enabling uh, uh, between multiple orgs. So the link you had on the right-hand side, is that basically like just a record link? Like, could you copy and paste that link in the Japan org to get to that alert? Yes. Same thing, okay. yeah. Okay. It's a. It, it's a. Uh, it's basically. I have. Um, this is. This is the link here. Okay. Right. And so it, that's. That would be the same. That would be ultimately it'd be the same thing. Uh, we'll have to do it here, not to mess things up. It's a little get could get a little confusing. So I mean, obviously, if if I go and look at this Lightning View, for instance, that's the link there. Okay. I mean, that, I, I was I was putting this with the I was playing and thinking of an idea. How would I demonstrate it the, the quickest and easiest? And the simplest way I could think of is by just throwing in a little component with a link up there that it will be visually so. Okay, well, you have an international account alert or something like that. Or you could have a potentially some other component to pointing to, let's say, a dashboard or a report or something like that. Yeah. No, this is great because like all the examples say, oh, well, just you know, put a connected app on the app launcher. But this, I mean, this looks like a more realistic use case where you're literally linking records from one org to the other, and you know, theoretically behind the scenes, you've got some communication happening between the orgs that would enable that. Yes, and uh, and that's also that's a uh, another point too is that uh, you, this this is what would be called a deep linking, right? And some of the uh, interesting factors is that. If you look at this link, if we click on this, obviously this link carries this ID here, which is pointing to this particular account. Um, and this entire URL, in fact, would be passed in through SSO uh, when it is doing the first time kind of transfer. That will be passed through a parameter called a relay state. Very important piece of information 
to pass that kind of data to do deep linking. Uh, that may not be as much of an effect uh, within Salesforce multiple orgs, but it definitely touches uh, some issues on the external IDPs. If you're working with some other IDPs, frequently they lose this relay state in the process. And then users just end up in their home screen. I don't know what's going on, where they are. Uh, and they get very confused. And they ask questions from admins and developers and architects. And then you scratch in your head, like, how did it happen? right? But that happens. And so you have to basically work with your uh, IT department and understand why it lost. So frequently, there's settings issues on the IDPs that would lose that relay state, just to keep in mind. I think there might be some questions around that. On the task. Right. So, so, so essentially, this is an SP initiated yes, login with a relay state to do a deep link. Yes. Or had several questions, probably. So, where is that relay state? Like, like, did you have to configure something either on the IDP or the SP to make that relay work? Not for Salesforce. Uh, okay. So, the deep, the deep link itself, uh, essentially, when you click on it, as it as it goes through the process of logging yourself, logging you in into another org. Uh, that link should be, oh, in Salesforce, it will be automatically appended in there. Uh, there is no specifically URL I need to configure or anything else like that. I, IDP takes care of that. If you navigating to a URL that doesn't live in your org, uh, you're passing it to the IDP, it should know that, OK, well, this is a relay state. Uh, I'm going somewhere else. I need to save this and pass it on. OK. This is the key piece of, of, of understanding your IDPs or, or picking an IDP to understand if they will do this. Because if you want to do this type of stuff, the IDP either does or doesn't, and you can't really force it to happen. Yes. You know, so you have to understand that they support that. And then there, there may be specific parameters you set to pass it in, or it may just be that it understands it from the URL, pulls that piece off, and then relays it back through. Yeah, from from a, I think from an admin or architect perspective, you don't need to worry about it. As a developer, though, you do definitely. If you're dealing with SSO and coding IDPs, you definitely have to worry about that. Um, and, and the same thing with with the OAuth as well. Uh, but but from our point of view, I think we're sitting at a little bit higher level. Uh, you don't have to worry about it. Although, the, like I mentioned, we do need to make sure that IDPs are supported, or at least uh, a configuration is there. Typical IDPs would support relay state because it's part of the SAML um, dance, if you will. Um, but they, they may need to be enabled or they may need to be configured because some organizations may actually purposely turn it off for security reasons. They don't want people jumping around. Um, I have a question here, Sasi. Uh, uh, can you go to the connected app? I saw in the uh, subject type. There were five options, but when you set up SSO in your service provider, you have basically only three options, right? Username, user ID, and federation ID. No, there's, there's um, uh, well, no, there's a username, federation ID, user ID, custom, custom attribute, and uh, persistent ID. So how, how do you, for example, how do you use a custom field? I believe custom field from user custom, object. Custom, right? attribute, custom attribute. So in a custom attribute, if you selected this, uh -huh. Now, I, I don't have any custom attributes set up, but you would have them here, and you would choose which one. Now, in the past, when working with communities, and oh, by the way, one other thing to note is that this same setup of multiple orgs work for multiple communities. You, you may want to set up like SSO to communities that could also act the same way. But in the past, when I had this kind of situation working with multiple uh, endpoints, or, or there's multiple attributes that you, you work with users, um, you would select which one you want to map to. So the custom attribute, this is essentially identifying your federation ID uh, being not standard, but something custom. So it's ultimately still a f some piece of information that exists yeah. on all everywhere in the federation. It's just not stored like in the federation ID field Correct. necessarily. This is all it is. Yeah, subject type is really what that is. It's either federation ID or username. But username frequently is an email address or a very form of an email address. And often it may be, you know, di different, or it might have some other issues. It's not always the best thing, right. especially in Salesforce, where your username has to be unique across orgs. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like for example, username wouldn't work for me here because if um, uh, the, the the person that's here, right? So Linda Walker uh, has her user ID as us. And then the other one, she has it as uh, like a core JP. So their, their usernames are different.
Cool. Okay. All right. Thank you. Amit, you are up with um, uh, SSO. With yep. Okay. Hey, so uh, we created the user in both environments, one in identity provider, another in service provider. So service provider password policy have any impact to the user? Uh, yes, it would. Um, and obviously, yes, if there's if there was like a password reset or something like that, uh, it will affect Linda essentially, but only on this org, right? Uh, for example, the fact that she goes by the Federation ID, right? We're only looking at the fact that she has a ID matching, which is in this case, just the simple number. Uh, let's say this is her employee number in a company. That's one, two, three, four, five, six. And it's the same across Japan as well as US and anywhere else. Um, and so it, it, it would, um, if she would want to go to here, obviously, it will have an effect on her. But when she travels on, on this um, enterprise level, uh, I think it doesn't, uh, I don't think it affects her as much in terms of policies because this policy here would be playing the role of authentication. So because this is the central IDP, that's where he, she's logging in. That's what she has access to. And then um, it, this is acting as a hub to just give her access, more access into another org. OK. Thank you. Hey, Igor, um, if you were using instead of Salesforce identity and external identity, right, um, you typically wouldn't set up a connected app. Uh, that's not a requirement from an ID perspective because the browser is doing the uh, the SAML federation for us, right? It's handling that. What was the need for the connected app? Did, um... Yes, so connected app is purely Salesforce thing um, because we. this is, remember, the topic here is specifically Salesforce to Salesforce, right? So we're talking about multiple Salesforce orgs here as a topic. And so uh, the connected app is needed on an IDP to identify um, what is the, uh, let's see, uh, uh, basically, what is my service provider? So in this case, I only had one, which is Takumi Japan. Potentially, if I had multiple orgs, I would have more than one connected app that identify each one, which then carries the information for my SSO configuration to my service provider. So it's an identifying service provider uh, telling its entity IDs. No, I think you answered my question. So it's, it's the metadata that typically any IDP would right. have. Yeah. In this case, we're just using connected app as a as a method. I, right. I think I think the bottom line here is any API connection into Salesforce needs a connected app. That's what Salesforce provides for you to control and be able to reject and knock people out. So this is essentially an API connection back in to form the identity, and that's why they're, you're having to put in the connected app. Is that's just what Salesforce sets up for anything coming in. Right. The other critical piece on the connected app is that ACS URL because that tells you where you're sending it back to and where you're sending the login information back. Thanks. Okay. Any other questions? Otherwise, we'll move on to Amit. All right. Thank you, Igor. Amit, you're up. And admit if you're talking, take your mute. Oh, there you are. You're presenting, but you're not talking yet. There you are. Your mute button's gone. Good. <laughs> well, hey everyone. Uh, thanks for the great presentation, Igor. Uh, wow. Are you able to see my screen? Oh yeah, it looks like a, like an endless tunnel of presentations. Yeah. <laughs> About a hundred on your screen. I'll get <laughs> Welcome to the funhouse. <laughs> oh, wow, this is okay. Um, let me start. Like, I am supposed to present on uh, G Suite and SSO. Like, how do we connect Google Suite with uh, Salesforce using SSO? I have not created any uh, since this was shown until I had not created any presentation. But if anyone needs any information, I'll be able to create a presentation and upload it in our folder. So, the first thing that I had to do was to get a G Suite admin connection. So there's a 14 day trial that you can uh, go and go and use. But one thing that you need to have is you need to have a um, domain registered, which you will have to use. So I didn't have that before uh, setting this up. So I had gone to GoDaddy and um, 
create a, a domain which I could use. Uh, so this is a domain that I had registered yesterday, salesforceamit.com, which is something from similar to how salesforceben.com is. And um, once you have that registered, both the process taken care of, like the domain and the admin setup done, uh, what you need to do is like uh, you need to first go into your Salesforce org, and since Google Suite is a is uses XAML for single sign-on, what you have to do is you have to enable your Salesforce org as a XAML identity provider by creating a, a my domain. So I have created a my domain, and since this is a Lightning enabled org, you have to compulsory have your domain uh, my domain created. So this is the uh, URL which you will be using later to replace some of the stuff. So once you have your uh, once you have the identity provider created, you have the option of downloading the certificate. And once you download a certificate, you go into the Google Admin tab. Uh, and there you have the option of going into security and single sign on. And here in this section, you will be able to update the certificate which you had downloaded from Salesforce. So you have to upload the certificate here. Then you have to update these values the sign in page URL, the sign out page, and change password page so what these are like standard urls but it you need to start replacing um, like if you there is a link which yeah there is a link here from salesforce which clearly mentions what the urls will be so these are the standard url and you need to replace your domain information in each of these urls so this is what i did when i um, was setting this up and in the bottom there is a checkbox which needs to be checked use a domain specific issuer use a domain specific issue and once you save this you need to come back to salesforce and create a connected app uh, for uh, for the for the G, for the gmail app so i have created a gmail as a connected app here and uh, I had provided information like uh, so while connecting the app, you have the option of providing information like how we were talking in the previous presentation, the ACS URL, the um, start there is on the, uh, the entity ID. So these are two things that you connect uh, that you update back in Salesforce. And thing is that here you will be using the domain which I was talking about earlier. You have to replace like these are also values that are present in this particular um, uh, document and you will have to start replacing information of your google app domain in this particular entity id and acs url then uh, what happens is you also have the option of uh, you need to have the subject type so here i've used federation id and once this is all connected, you also go back to the user record and update the federation ID. Like here, I have updated the federation ID with the email address that I have for my um, Google Suite application. And um, once this is done, you also need to do a last piece, which is uh, for this particular um, connected app you need to go to the manage option and give access to a profile or permission set so right now i have given system administrator profile access to this particular app so these are things that have to be done for you to set it up and once this is all set up you will get an option of uh, this connected app as an on the uh, on on this uh, on the app launcher and once you click on gmail what it does is like if you see the url which is going a bit fast it is trying to do the single sign on authentication signing and it will load your g so it did load my g suit app with uh, 
the the single sign on which i just set it up so and this is a lot similar to what Igor was telling earlier wherein you need to uh, like see here since salesforce is the identity provider you had to set up stuff like acs url entity id and uh, federation id to set up all the connections on salesforce like yeah this was uh, the presentation which i was supposed to do but yeah if there are any questions i may probably be able to answer so there was something in the documentation about like setting a relay state value and i followed i thought mm -hmm. i followed the instructions to the letter but when i go to gmail i just get the login screen i didn't get like all the way through to gmail like you did yes so yeah so there is a uh, uh, so yeah i have noted down these things which need to be changed so there is this piece of um, um, real estate that you need to add as a value uh, to the idp initiated login url which okay i did not i had forgotten to mention that uh, but this is what you copy this idp log this this url is what you copy and then the on this particular page you have the other option of what needs what it needs to get appended with the real estate url and then you get a url which is something like this and on the real estate again you have to replace your google app domain name with the domain name that you have created so this is what i had replaced it with in the end and you have to be careful to not remove the letter f i was almost about to remove it before i double checked it because this is really confusing and uh, once you have this setup there's uh, one more piece of information which is not there in this document that needs to be done is like you have to go to your connected uh, or you have to go to your admin console on uh, uh, on google suit and at the top of it you will have an option wherein you go for apps you will have an option like uh, since this was my first time connecting it has to verify your um, google domain name uh, you, it has to verify your domain name so once it once you're able to verify your domain name you will have the option of setting up the um, like you have the option of enabling uh, gmail so once you enable gmail at that point you will be able to um, like this would this if this is off for everyone and this you can't turn it on until you uh, until you go ahead and uh, um, verify the domain so i had to do that step and which was not mentioned in the uh, document which is there once this is done i was able to go ahead and uh, when i click on the connected app it was able to launch me into g suite without any issue okay Any questions from anybody? Anybody else try this? Did you run into any issues when you tried to set this up? So, so just, just so I make sure what you said, you not only have to set up your Salesforce org to use the My Domain, but you actually have to have another domain set up that kind of sits on top of yes. Google? Yes. OK. Well, and yeah. basically to use G Suite, it, it, the G Suite works with a custom domain name. And so okay. like I have like the ngmurphy.com domain, and I host my Gmail from Google Suite. And so it's like the paid version of Google. It's like $4 per user account or something. Um, and it allows you to have like branded emails, lets you use Google Docs and Hangouts and things like that. A little more than the free version of Google provides. So unless your company's setting this up or you're doing things on your own, there's really no reason to set up Google Suite, right? Right. Um, now, if you want to use like Google Suite for, let's say, um, your single, say your IDP, you know, let's say all your emails are run through G Suite instead of like O365 or something. Okay. And admit my apologies, I completely spaced off the fact that you had to have a domain to get into Google Suite. So sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, that, that that's fine. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Otherwise, we'll move on to David. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Amit. Yeah. All right, David, you're up. Um, David, if you're talking, press your unmute button. 
Are you actually, this is going to sound really bad. Are you talking about me? I think so. <laughs> I have no presentation because when I saw it last, because I had to go out of town, I was not on the list. Did you change it? Uh, I'm not sure, but okay. Well, it was on Monday's presenter list. Okay, well, um, let's talk about just-in-time provisioning then if, with the group. Um, what do you guys know about just-in-time provisioning? Anybody that's worked with it, any ahas or gotchas that we need to know about? So, so I've set it up a couple of times. Um, trying to think what to cover issues for. So, so one of the items to set up, um, it's basically, as we've kind of already touched on, it is creating users on the fly based on information that's passed through SAML. Um, so essentially, there's a little dance that goes on within Salesforce that if you end up turning this on, the parameters you pass through, it starts to look in the org to determine how it can match up to somebody. And that differs whether it's whether you're setting up the base setup or whether you're coming into a community. Basically, under the base setup, I think there's four parameters that are required. You have to have a, the federation ID, um, last name, username, and profile. So, so if you're kind of thinking of the key things you have to have to set up a user, um, those certainly would have to come through in order to um, create that user. There's uh, there's a standard setup where Salesforce just does the information for you, or you can set up your own class to do anything special that you process with those parameters coming in. Um, I'll kind of stop there, you know, not take up the whole time, but. We yeah, there was a, in the study guide, there's actually a sample question about um, just-in-time provisioning and Two of the options are, you know, you use the standard just-in-time provisioning or you use your custom just-in-time provisioning. And I posted a question in the Trailblazer community because I really didn't know, like, well, why wouldn't you just use the standard one? You know, it's Salesforce to Salesforce in the that particular exam scenario. Why not just use the standard provisioning? Um, and the answer that came back, and I don't know if this was the person that wrote the sample question or what, was basically that you can't rely on... Um, the other Salesforce orgs to know about all the same profile names that are in the hub org. And Igor right. touched on this in his presentation. Um, I don't know how I would have answered that question in the exam <laughs> if that had come up because it just seemed like there was not enough information there to answer that question. <laughs> well, so, right. So, so when you, when you had mentioned about things to look out for, that's where we ended up um, creating a custom version uh, in the same, we set up a service org. Um, the direct logins in, we were fully able to use the standard provisioning, no issue. We also set up a community, an employee community, for people to come in and get access to key pieces. And that's where we ended up having to set up a custom uh, class to do this. Because if you think of communities and, and the base communities taking employee community out of there, typically you need a contact, you need an account, and then the user is connected to that. And that's how you end up getting a lot of your permissions. That's not required with an employee community but it seemed through the auto provisioning it still wanted to deal with accounts and contacts and we could not make it work out to where that would work so we basically had to go to a custom um custom class that ignored all the account and contact information and just set up the the provided user details now keep in mind when you go to the custom you're now responsible for everything so whereas um the key fields will come in as long as you have the four um uh, parameter set up, it will work. If you go to custom, you've now got to set those four, plus any additional things that are required, um, like the locale, the um, language, you know, any of those particular pieces, if you've ever tried to load users, um, there ends up being about seven or eight fields that you have to set, and you'll now have to set every single one of those for, um, if you're doing it custom versus standard, it kind of, it, those other issues around locale and language and stuff kind of just get set. Um, you don't even have to pass them through. They're just, it's just done. Yeah. One of the, th one of the things that I, uh, like something that I said there, I, I, I don't know, obviously the use case, but, um, with communities and communities is a kind of a separate, uh, thing from Salesforce. Uh, it's a, like a separate entity, but frequently they work together or need to work together with Salesforce. And uh, in some of the setups that I have uh, been involved in, uh, it's really not need to provision users in the community as long as uh, the users in Salesforce are okay with coming in with that same user and interacting with the community as a Salesforce user. All you need to do is make that profile 
uh, of that user a member of the community and they automatically get access to any community uh, resources that are out there. Now, the use case is that another on the flip side of things, there are situations where you're dealing with uh, uh, customer communities that have login licenses and they have chatters and they have things like that. Those, those things are actually live within community and they're not necessarily shared or even shareable to the internal sales force. Now, if your user is such a role that he needs to interact on these chatters or on these posts, on these answers and questions and, and actively work with customers, they actually need to be as one of the community user licenses rather than being their own Salesforce full, let's say, service license. And right, and that, that's, a, that's yeah. the case we ran into and why we had to separate them is we have uh, users coming in that won't have a full license, they'll only have a community license. And that's where then you have to tie them to a specific user. Right, and that is, that is the case where you actually need to deal with uh, either person accounts uh, or uh, contacts and accounts, depending on what the setup is. So this is something I've been struggling with because, um, and it goes back to single sign-on versus social sign-on. Um, and I know, you know, single sign-on, you're looking at um, SAML and then social sign-on, we're using OpenID Connect. And they have two separate registration handlers that they use. And with SAML sign-on, you know, I understand we're matching either on a federation ID, you know, we both sides agree on how they're going to send the user through and what field is going to contain the user information. But on social sign on, the part I'm not getting is how does Salesforce know whether they already own the have the user or not? And I can't find anything in the documentation that really spells that out. Apparently nobody else does either. Hopefully it doesn't come up on the exam. Best thing I could figure out, and I'm going to play with this some more, is maybe like the email that comes in on the open ID response. Um, it seems to somehow be tied to email, or at least with provisioning, like it takes your email address and you know can add some stuff to it, creates this unique user. Um, so when I was going through the communities, uh, the identity for customers trailhead, I set myself up with Gmail. And I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to change my Facebook email to match my Gmail email and try to provision that way and see what happens and see if it says, hey, there's too many users with this email address. I don't know who's who. I'm hoping that's what will happen. OK. Because otherwise, I have no idea. I, well, I think I think that is part of the thing uh, some, somewhere. I think I've read in documentation that you actually need a um, registration handler in those cases for social sign on, like with Facebook in particular. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is the registration handler is really an Apex class that you're building. And similar to like community registrations, which is basically now you're building a custom registration uh, code that enables you to actually create things under, under the covers and match. For example, OK, if I know the person coming in from Facebook, then they need to be assigned. Because they ultimately need to be assigned a license. They need to be assigned a profile ID. And so you would have to build in those rules in your custom code to say, I want to map to that account, to that profile ID, or I want to create this user with a specific permissions and whatnot. Uh, because when you come in the social, it's like, what are you going to get? Are you going to get a chat a free account or what, what's the, what's the default? Right. Right. That's, yeah. And, and the, yeah. And that part is all clear to me. The part that's not clear is I get, you know, my open ID information back from Facebook. How am I matching that to a user that already exists? Like, how do I know I don't need to provision the user? Yeah, and that's, and, that's, and that's what I think is the registration. I mean, at least the way I understand it is I think the registration handler is the one you build in those code. How you how do you want to match it? It's like you Yeah, you, well, you I, looked at, I looked in the code. There's nothing there that says, um, you know, it, it, you know it, it, it implements an interface. And there's something under the covers going on with Salesforce. Because the only thing in that registration handler is like a create user and an update user. But it doesn't tell you how does it pull in the user that you're updating. Yeah, it's because they don't, they don't give you all the code and that, yeah. you would, that you would need for it. Because you would need to query. Uh, you would need to do queries on profiles. You need to do queries on permission sets and assign all that. Because you, in order to create a user, you're going to have to assign those values to the user, right? Right. And I just don't know. Like for on the SAML side, it says, OK, it, look, it looks at you know, whatever's sent in, the federation ID, the user ID, and it matches based on that. And if it doesn't find a match, it's going to create a new user. I haven't found that same kind of logic 
on the social sign-on side that says, when you get this open ID information, we're going to look for, let's say, the email. And if we find the email, then we're going to oh. use that user. Oh, I see. You, you, you are asking a question about when what the standard Salesforce looking for. Is yeah, it, yeah. Just, like how does it how does it know if yeah. I've already registered? Or yeah, not? So, so that's a that's a I th that's a good question. I think that is encoded inside Salesforce standard registration handler. <laughs> just, yeah, but just, how? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so I think I'm just going to try to, because like I said, I've set it up with a Gmail account. I'm going to set up my Facebook. Yeah. I'm going to edit my mm -hmm. Facebook account to use my Gmail email address and see what happens. One of the trails that Igor was mentioning, uh, Natalia, I might have put in a link. Uh, there's a GitHub uh, where the registration handler has a slightly more uh, robust implementation. Uh, I think next uh, on 10th, when I have the customer community and uh, identity provider, Chantal, I'd have to do all of this work myself too. So I'll do some research as well. Okay. Yeah. And I, it must be like matching on email address is kind of my guess, but I, I'm going to play around with this some more because that's like the missing piece for me is I know how SAML assertion connects with Salesforce user. I don't know how an open ID assertion connects with a Salesforce user. And it's just driving me bonkers. And maybe that's deeper than we need to go for to be able to pass the exam. But I feel like it's a missing piece of the puzzle. Yeah, so I mean, Salesforce must have a, and it's probably email address. You, you probably write Natalia. It's probably email address to match up the user search, right, uh, from the from the uh, social login, right. And then and then the uh, typical implementations they they would give you, and you would have to create your own sort of code to match that user, which basically may mean uh, some type of special custom user field or something that will match up to your social profile to actually create those or provision those users. Yeah, because one of the things I didn't see is like nowhere on the user record, at least not on the fields that are displayed, do I see that, you know, this user was provisioned coming in from Facebook or this user was provisioned coming in from Google. And I don't know that that even matters. Maybe it's just as simple as it matches on email ID and I'm overthinking it. So I don't know. <laughs> it, it seems to me, because like Google, you can set up Google as um, an identity provider through the single sign-on page, in which case you're expecting SAML to come in. Or you can set up Google as an auth provider, in which case it's sending an open ID message through. And it's like, when would you use one and when would you use the other if you can use both? That's what's been keeping me up at night the past few days. <laughs> so <laughs> happy to share my confusion with all of you. <laughs> you need to change what you're thinking about at night. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I want to get this exam passed. <laughs> That's what I'm thinking about at night. <laughs> but, uh, by the way, another gotcha here to keep a, to be aware of real quick. Um, we've got a few more minutes. Is uh -huh. the auto provisioning piece is very nice where it creates new users. Uh -huh. The update piece is where that gotcha ends up being. So um, let's say, and where we ran into this, we had a bunch of testers who created three or four different logins that they would come in representing different people. Um, that goes away when you get to uh, single sign-on, especially if you start talking about auto-provisioning, because now it's going to bring through for the user what their profile is. So you can't go in and switch it to let them act to somebody else. Because as soon as they log in, it's going to update. Where And this may be where you, again, put in a custom piece that you only deal with profile on a create, not an update. But they go in and change them to a different tester. They go and log in. It's going to switch them back to whatever your IDP says they should be in terms of profile. So something to be aware of you know, around the, the, the creation of users is very nice. But the ongoing update sometimes can keep you from doing things you want to do. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, um, yeah, okay, well, wow, lots of good information today. So um, for next session, we're going to start playing with communities and do, do a little more SSO. And Joseph, you are up to give us the concept of SSO troubleshooting, what kind of problems can you run into, and how do you fix them? And Pavitra, um, we already saw SAML validator, so your challenge is to find other ways beyond the SAML validator to figure out SSO problems and how to solve them. And then Brenda will talk about OpenID Connect, give us an overview of that. And maybe we'll answer the magic question of how the heck does it know when you get an OpenID message who the user really is. And with that, we are 
done for today. Um, we'll see you all on Friday. As always, um, I'm going to stop recording now.